In the last two days, we've picked 28 pounds of strawberries. I like strawberries and cream as much as the next person. We love drying them, we love making strawberry jam, but there's still a lot left. So let's make some strawberry wine. Hello, welcome to English Country Life. Welcome to the kitchen. Welcome to strawberry wine making. We recently did a series of videos on country wines and we covered, as an example, elderflower wine. And in episode one of that, we talked about gathering the flowers, we talked about making a must, which is the basis of the liquid that we're going to ferment. In episode two, we talked about getting a yeast starter culture going, we talked about brewing vessels and airlocks and starting fermentation. And in episode three, we talked about clearing the wine, racking it off, bottling wine, etc. So we've covered the basics in that series of videos. And if you've never done any country wine making, I'd recommend have a look at them. But fruit wine making is a little bit different. So today we're going to make some strawberry wine. Let's get going. The recipe I'm going to give you to make strawberry wine is enough for 12 bottles, two demijohns, nine litres or two gallons, depending on your measurement of choice. Let's say it's enough for 12 standard wine bottles. First thing we're going to need is a lot of strawberries, specifically four kilos. We pour those into a clean, disinfected brewing vessel. I disinfect by using an egg cup full of bleach, filling the vessel with water, leaving it for 30 minutes and then rinsing twice. So in there, four kilos of strawberries. First thing we have to do to get the juice out of our strawberries to make the wine is break them up. The whole berries are quite hard to extract juice from. So break them up and the easiest tool to use for that is a potato masher. Having thoroughly mashed your strawberries, get yourself a big wooden spoon and add three kilos of sugar to your four kilos of strawberries. Mix it up well. And this sugar will serve to draw the liquid out of the smashed strawberry pulp. And we will leave that to do its work for a couple of hours. After a couple of hours, when the sugar's drawn a lot of juice out of the strawberries, pour on eight litres of boiling water and then give the whole lot a really good stir make sure all the sugar is dissolved put a lid on it and leave it for 24 hours before we get into straining off our fruit and carrying on with the wine making i'd just like to show you this device this is a big over sink what's called a convertible colander made by a firm called oxo good grips these little legs stand it up so you can stand it in the base of your sink for straining stuff and you can just pour your strawberries in, keep the tap running and wash them off. You can also extend those legs so that it spans over the top of the sink and actually the legs hold it up. That's very useful again for cleaning all our produce, washing off carrots and anything we might want to do like that outside. It also means it can span a five gallon bucket. So terribly useful for straining off fruit, etc. when we're doing country wines. If you ever see one like it, I would grab it. I'm gonna be honest here. I've left this a couple of days longer than I normally would. Life got in the way. It's given rise though to something quite interesting. If you have a look around the edge of the strawberries, you can see there's some bubbles forming. And that's because wild yeasts naturally present on the strawberries have started the fermentation process. That's not a problem. We will add proper general purpose wine yeast anyway because some of the wild yeasts ferment out at a very low alcohol level. So I'd like this to ferment out to about sort of 12-13% alcohol so I'll use a wine yeast but it does show you if you don't have wine yeast with a lot of fruits you can still get a very good country wine. The next step in the process then is to strain off the fruit pulp from the liquid must. All the strawberry flavours now in the liquid. 
we need to get rid of the fruit pulp in order to start fermenting properly. I cannot suggest this strongly enough. Use a two-stage straining process. A big coarse colander to get rid of the bulk of the fruit pulp, then a fine muslin to get rid of any small particles. And if you go straight to the fine straining, the coarse stuff just clogs the muslin. If you don't do the fine straining, you'll end up with a cloudy wine. So let's look at that two-stage process. First part then of the straining process is to use a coarse colander and just use a jug to bale the fruit from our infusing vessel into a clean sterilized secondary vessel. Once you've strained through the colander, you've got rid of all the big fruit lumps. But you can see from this must that there are still smaller fruit fibres suspended in the liquid. They're released when we crush the fruit to release the juice. It's an inevitable part of the process, but we need to restrain with a finer mash in order to get rid of them. The finer filter I use is the same colander with a couple of layers of muslin put over the top. And what I've done before starting this is to wash out the original bucket, wash very well the colander and then line it with a couple of layers of muslin held in place with some elastic bands and then that is ready to bale the juice the other way through the muslin to get rid of a lot of the finer particles. You can already see just how much fine material that muslin's trapping. Give it a good amount of time to drip through. You might need to wash off the muslin several times during this process. When you can hear that your filter is dripping rather than the liquid gushing through, it's time to wash your filter. You can see here at the bottom left I've scraped together a lot of the almost jelly-like smaller fruit particles that this kind of filtration has trapped out. Try to imagine how difficult it is to settle that amount out in a demijohn. And that is a tiny fraction of what a demijohn would contain. So this fine filtration really will improve the quality of your wine. This stage is optional. Fruit contains, to a greater or lesser degree, depending on the fruit, pectin. Pectin is the setting agent in jam, and we talk about it in some detail in our Gooseberry Jam video. I would recommend, if you want to understand the science of pectin, go and take a look at that video. A side effect of pectin is that it makes wine cloudy. And it particularly is a problem with a high pectin fruit and where we've used heat to dissolve out fruit flavours as we did in this recipe. We use hot water on our strawberries to help dissolve out the flavour. Now, strawberries aren't overly high in pectin, but it's still useful if we can to remove that pectin to prevent cloudiness later. And the way we do that is the use of a natural enzyme called pectylase or pectic enzyme. You can buy it from homebrew shops. For this recipe, what we need to do is add four level teaspoons, assuming we're making 12 bottles, to half a cup of warm water, dissolve it, add it to our wine must and leave it for 24 hours. And that enzyme will then break down any pectin that's naturally present in the fruit. So in this glass of warm water, there are four teaspoons of pectic enzyme. I just stir that until it's fully dissolved. And this is the reason we do it in a glass, so that you can tell in the glass when it's fully dissolved. In a red liquid, a large volume of liquid, it's hard to tell that the pectic enzyme hasn't just settled to the bottom. We've given the pectic enzyme 24 hours to break down any pectin, and now it's time to start fermentation on our strawberry wine. 
going to use a general purpose wine yeast and I'm going to add some yeast nutrient. It's not that vital to use yeast nutrient with berry wines. There's usually enough nutrients in the berries themselves. With flower wines, it's vital. But to be honest, it does no harm and it's just as easy to add some to be sure. For best results, what I do is I put my yeast and yeast nutrient measured measuring spoons into a glass of just warm orange juice and I give the whole thing a stir. The purpose of this is that the orange juice has natural fruit sugars in it. It won't hurt the acidity or the flavour of the wine. What it does is it allows the yeast to rehydrate, begin fermenting and come up to temperature before we add it to the wine must. So there's less of a shock when it's poured into a large volume of liquid. You can also check that the yeast is working. We'll have a look at that shortly, but we should be able to tell by seeing bubbles rising in the orange juice. Another thing we're going to add to our wine is some tannin. Tannin is found in grape skins. It gives that astringent quality that you get with red wines that sort of almost coats your teeth. But a little bit of it really improves the complexity of the wine. We're going to add a quarter of a teaspoon of wine tannin. If you haven't got any, brew some strong black tea and add one teaspoon for two demijohns, half a teaspoon per demijohn of strong black tea to your mix. The last thing we're going to add to our strawberry must is two teaspoons of citric acid, one per demijohn. If you haven't got any, use the juice of a lemon to replace one teaspoon of citric acid. Yeast requires a slightly acidic environment in which to work and what we're doing here is just raising the acidity because there's almost no acidity in strawberries. In this glass I've got one teaspoon of citric acid for each demijohn, so two teaspoons, and one eighth of a teaspoon of wine tanning, so that's a quarter teaspoon for our two demijohns. And all I'm doing is dissolving it. I have found in the past, wine tanning can be a little bit hard to dissolve. And um, if you just dump it in the wine must, it can settle as a clump to the bottom and you don't even realize that it hasn't dissolved properly. So I find dissolving it outside the wine must in a glass of warm water, far more effective. This is our wine must. Doesn't it look a fabulous color? I mean, I just love the color of strawberry wine. So let's add in our yeast, yeast nutrient, the wine tannin and the citric acid. Here we go. That's the yeast culture. And in goes the wine tannin and the citric acid. So having mixed the ingredients in well, we're going to let that ferment for a couple of days. This is what's called primary fermentation. And with some fruit wines, it's quite violent. And if you put it in a demijohn with an airlock, it'll foam through the airlock because it's fermenting so hard. So we'll just make sure it's settled down to a nice, steady fermentation before we do any transfer into a demijohn. This device is a hydrometer. And when you're making fruit wines particularly, but in reality all wines, it can be useful to measure what's called the gravity of the wine before and after fermentation. There's then a calculation you can do, which will tell you how much alcohol is in the wine. Given that fruit sugars vary, it's very useful to know, and it can allow you, when more experienced, to adjust the amount of sugar that you add to a wine to get the strength of wine you want. It's very simple. There's a weight at the bottom and a scale on the neck. And what happens is it will sink to a different level depending on the level of material that's dissolved in the liquid that you're floating it in. And you can take a reading from this scale and that determines what's called the specific gravity and the difference between the original gravity and the final gravity allows you to work out how much sugar has been converted. Let's have a go. Here you can see the hydrometer floating in the glass and you can see that it's possible if you sort of get at eye level that you can read off from the scale the specific gravity of your must. 
Ours is currently reading 1.095. Water is 1. 1.0000. And what we're reading there is the amount of dissolved material in the water. And the difference, once we have the alcohol, shows how much sugar is converted. It's quite a simple process, although people are often scared of it. So 1.095, we'll measure it again when fermentation finishes. And this is why we do a primary fermentation in a bucket. You can see the froth forming as this violently ferments out the initial free sugar. That will just foam through the airlock on a demijohn. So we give it a day or two in the bucket till that calms down and then we'll transfer to the demijohn. In our elderflower wine series we explain the process of racking off, why using a siphon to leave the sediment behind is helpful, and how a particular type of siphon avoids sucking up disturbed sediment. Same rules apply here. We may not be siphoning off or racking off to use the correct term, from one demijohn to another, but we want to leave as much sediment behind in the primary fermenting vessel as we can. After racking it off into the demijohns, I'm going to wrap each demijohn in brown paper. People ask a lot why I do that. Well, this is going to be a delicate pink wine. And if I leave that in bright sunshine for over a month, most of that pinkness will get bleached out and it will just look like water. So the brown paper just protects the colour of the wine. At this stage of the fermentation process, I'm going to leave a large amount of headspace, there you go, new technical term, the amount of room at the top of the demijohn. I'm going to leave a decent amount of headspace in case it foams during secondary fermentation. That means I'm going to have to use three demijohns. As soon as I'm sure it's calm, I will top that demijohn up more towards the neck. Well now, here we go, a few days in, fermenting away beautifully. So our strawberry wine is well on the way. And from this point on, the process of racking and fining and filtering and bottling and all of that good stuff is very much the same as our elderflower wine recipe. So I'll put a link to that above. And if you want to jump ahead to know how that's done, just have a look at that. Other than the colour, process is the same. One point I did want to make is take a look at this one. This little demijohn. Obviously, as you can see, fermenting still quite violently. That's raspberry and blackberry wine. Why raspberry and blackberry? Because I didn't have quite enough blackberries to do 12 bottles, so we added some of our raspberries. And that's the point I'm trying to get to. Fruit wines, the process of fruit wines, is almost identical. It doesn't matter what you use. If it's a good jamming fruit, like a blackcurrant, really, really do consider using pectic enzyme because it will make the wine cloudy, that amount of pectin. But general pr principles, the way it's done is very much the same whether you're making blackberry wine or damson wine, it doesn't matter at all. So feel free to take this process and experiment. You can also experiment with different sugars. I think if it's a pure blackberry wine, a darker sugar like a Demerara is really nice. It gives it a richness and a body that it wouldn't otherwise have. We will do a quick update at some point so that we can measure the specific gravity at the end of the fermentation process and we can calculate the amount of alcohol in the wine. And we can take a quick look at bottling and clearing again if you like. If you're enjoying this kind of process, can you take two seconds? Just down there, give us a thumbs up. If you want to see the second part of this series, or indeed all the other videos that we produce, click the subscribe icon and the bell next to it, and you'll hear when we post anything at all. But whatever you do, come back and see us soon. Take care.